All right, again, Isaiah 6, and we're going to wrap it up today with this. And um, it, it, I guess it may be a little bit different today. It uh, may be kind of on a simple factor, I guess. But still at the same token, I, I think it's something there for all of us to see and understand and, and learn. And, and you know where we're at, it's Isaiah 6. And we start again in verse 1. <clears throat> in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and a, the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each had six wings, one that covered his face, two, two that covered his face, two that covered his feet, and two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. And the last verse, it says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. You know, <clears throat> can you imagine again, you know, we talked about how Isaiah, you know, possibly in a, in a vision or sleep or dream or, or whatever it was that he's seen. And we see what he's seen. And, and I hope during the time that we've talked about this in, in some way that maybe God has showed you something. Because I know that he has me even, even in all the studying I've done over this and the things I've seen, and even the things that God showed me that I even, even I couldn't even remember to, to share, can, can you just imagine God truly revealing Himself to you in, in some form, some way, <clears throat> whether through a, a, a bad experience or, or a good experience or, or just <clears throat> in, in His Word that, that He just opened your eyes for some reason, just, just I mean, to, to the point that you can't explain it. To the point that you just cannot explain it. And, and if you really stop and look at just these few little verses, just these few little verses, Isaiah's trying to describe what he's seen. Do you truly think that's all he saw? I don't. I think there was so much more that he's seen. But he just couldn't put it in words. And even if he did put it, try to put it in words, he couldn't even convey the, the feeling, the heart depth that God wanted him to see and feel. You know, so you can just picture and, and then just, you know, him, him truly seeing, you know, God on his throne and, and these, these seraphim flying and, and shouting and, and just praising God. And, that, and that's all they did. And then all of a sudden, at the very end of all of this, he said, also I heard the voice of the Lord. And all of this, everything that he's seen, he, he's seen the seraphim shouting, holy, holy, holy. And then all of a sudden, heard the voice of God. Another big question, have we ever heard the voice of God? Have you ever heard the voice of God? You know, every one of us can, <clears throat> can say, you know, you know, I heard God say. I heard God say this. I heard God say that. I heard God tell me to do this or this. You know, and, and even if we sat and tried to describe what it sounded like, we never could convey what it truly sounded like to another person. Well, there's no way. We, you can't do it. It's just impossible. Because he may speak to me one way, and he may speak to you another way. So there's no way to know exactly what his voice sounded like. You know, even in John 10 and 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. People of this world says that God don't talk to them. You can't hear God. That's not true. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. My sheep, the ones that truly belong to Him. He says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them. You see, that's one of the key things in that verse. He says, I know them. 
I know the ones who truly listen. I know the ones who listen. I know the ones who hear me. And it goes on and says, and they follow me. So think about Isaiah when he said he heard God's voice. And even in John 8 and 47, it says, He who is of God hear, hears God's words. He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. So many, maybe the ones that don't hear Him ain't of God. Many people, it's truly sad, <clears throat> many people in this world, and, and I've been hearing for some reason this past week just over and over and over and different things, and, 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 I, and I can share it with you. I mean, I, I sit and do a, a lot of welding at work, and when I'm sitting there, I listen to different things, different pastors, uh, documentaries, and, and y'all know this because I've shared many of you. And, and, and that's what I do. And, and for some reason, over and over and over this week, I keep hearing this thing. So many people think they're Christians and are not. So many people that are sitting in churches today think they're Christians and they're not. Jesus said, the ones that know me hear me. And I know them, and they follow me. Can you imagine Isaiah, the day that he wrote this, and he said, I heard the voice of the Lord. And he'd already been doing the work of God. Think about it. He had been doing the work of God, and now all of a sudden, he's seen him, and he heard him. Listen to what he said. Listen, I heard him. I heard the voice of the Lord. You know, we can hear God's voice in many ways. You know, through, through others speaking, through others' experiences, through, through, through the Bible. You know, it's truly sad that so many people that even go to churches today, they never open this book except one hour on Sunday. They don't. It's truly sad. Never. Never open it. Never look at it. Probably couldn't tell you how many books is in it during the week except for Sunday. You want to know God? Open it. Look at it. Read it. Study it. Find out what He says. Maybe He'll talk to you. Maybe He'll show you some things. And it's truly sad. The world today and that's, that, that got me to thinking. All the things I heard this week so many times, so many, Christ, so many people in the churches today say they are Christians and don't even know Jesus. Don't know Him. Don't even know Him. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And then it went on. It says He heard the voice of the Lord. You ever wonder what the true voice of God is? You ever wonder what a true, the true voice of God is? The Bible tells us. It does. The Bible tells you what it's like. What it sounds like. It really does. The Bible tells you. Let me show you. <clears throat> the voice of the Lord. And here's one verse, and, and this, is, this is just to get it going. In John 10 and 4 it says, And when he put forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Okay, for they know his voice. And because, you know, if, if you got a, if you got a little pet at home, you know, and, and you have a pet, well, then that pet knows your voice. You know, if I come up and go to hollering, it'd probably go to barking at me or scratching or whatever, you know. But the, the animal knows your voice. The sheep, they know their master's voice. The word voice, the word voice, in this particular sense, in Isaiah Verse 6, if you look it up, in this particular sense, this word voice means thunder. And that's what it means. It means thunder. How many of you heard thunder? Probably everybody out here heard it yesterday. The other night, <clears throat> we was asleep. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning. I heard a little something. For some reason, I woke up and I heard a little something. And it wasn't but just a few minutes later, friends, listen. 
It was probably one of the loudest thunders I have ever heard in my life. I mean, it just rolled and it rumbled. And this one come flying up in the room, jumped up in the bed, got on Mama's side, and she said, no, I'm scared. I want in the middle. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, it was rumbling. I mean, the windows were shaking. And I'm, it, seriously, I mean, it was unreal. Our daughter said that they even got up out of the bed because it scared them so bad. Can you imagine that coming out of God's mouth when he speaks? Picture it in your mind. A voice like thunder. The power. The, 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 just, the, just the magnitude of it. Psalms 29 and 3. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Take it in your, in, in your, in your, in your imagination again. The, uh, a voice with thunder combined with majesty of who God is. The God that we're supposed to love. The God that we're supposed to worship and fall on our knees and cry to and praise and lift His name on high. That God. The God that has this thunder of majesty. And even in Job. Job said this about Him in 37.4. After it a voice roars His thunders with His majestic voice. Just the power of God, the voice of God. Isaiah said, and I heard the voice of God. And even Job, it goes on. It says, and he does not restrain them when his voice is heard. God thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things which we cannot comprehend. Think of Isaiah hearing the voice of God. All of these things have done happen in, in, his, in, in his vision or dream. All of these things he'd unseen and possibly many things he couldn't even describe or anything. And all of a sudden this boom, this roar, he heard his voice, just, just this powerful voice. And even in Job 40 and 9 it says, Have you an arm like God or can you thunder with a voice like his? We don't even compare to God with our voices and our sounds. And I can just, I can just picture even the, the, the biggest megaphone or whatever when you hear this sound coming out, like in stadiums or whatever, you don't even compare to God. It's just a muffle compared to the power of God coming from His voice. Friends, I can share this, and I can share this with true honesty. When, when God speaks to you, when, when, when you know that God has spoken to you personally, it will break you because you can't take it. It will put you literally down to your knees. And if you don't, if it, if it didn't, friends, it, you, you might have heard something else. That's the truth. It will break you because there's so much power. Is it, is, it, is it an audible voice? I can't answer that. Many say no. But I know I've heard Him. And it, it will break you. It will humble you and it will put you down to your knees to where you break and you weep. And you see something inside of you that you've never seen that you don't want to see again. Isaiah seen. He said, he, I heard the voice of the Lord. And then what did God say? He turned around. And this is where I really enjoy this part. It says, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? The word whom, W-H-O-M. Do you know in today's time you hardly ever hear it anymore? You, you really don't. You, you hardly ever hear it anymore. You hear the word who. The word whom means to let loose. Think about it. God said, whom? You know, whom can we let loose? Who can we turn loose? 
picture in your mind. He, he's, he's, he's really touching Isaiah. He's, he's really wanting this man for a reason. And this word whom means to let loose. So, so you, you, it kind of made me think a little bit. You know, if, if Isaiah previously was, was, you know, calling himself, you know, doing God's work, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm sure the man was, you know, knew the Lord. But, you know, maybe, and you know what I'm talking about. And God wanted to change him. He wanted to turn him loose. Do you know that there's so many people in this world that God wants to use, but they will not allow God to turn them loose? They won't allow God. Not God. God wants to turn them loose. But they won't allow God to turn them loose. Whom shall I send? Whom shall I send? And I really thought about that. You know, to turn loose. Even it means to let go. It also means this. It means to set free. You ever wonder how many people that are not serving God could be set free if they would just go to serving Him? Set free. And I don't mean like a jailbird. I mean set free in their soul, in their mind, in their spirit, to have the peace. Be set free. Whom shall I send? Matthew 9 and 36, it says this. It says, But when He saw the multitudes, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenty, but the laborers are few. I want you to look at what Jesus was saying. I've heard this verse time and time again, but I want you I want to really pinpoint something. It says the harvest truly, and he's talking to, he's talking to the disciples, okay? The harvest truly is plenty, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord to the harvest, send out laborers into his harvest. He had, he had guys he could send, but he's telling him to pray to the Lord to tell us he'll send out people. It's kind of like Jesus was asking, you know, whom shall I send? Does anybody want to go? Does anybody want to do this work? Does anybody want to really turn their life over and become what God wants them to be? And I thought that was really interesting. So moving on, moving on. I'm getting to a point. Just bear with me. And he turned around. He says, and, and God asked him, said, who, who will go for us? He says, whom shall I send? Whom shall I send? Okay, listen. Whom shall I send? And then he turned around and said, who will go for us? So the word us is plural, right? It means two. It means another one or somebody. Something is there. The word us means used by a speaker to refer to himself or herself and one or more other people. That's what it means. Who will go for us? Now this is God talking. It says who will go? He turned around and says who will go? First he said whom, then he said who will go for us. Okay? Now, I want you to understand, you know this little phrase, and who will go for us, the word us. When God uses us, how many times has God ever used the word us in the Bible? You know, one, it was in Genesis. Genesis 1, 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. And you know the rest of it. He said, Let us. You ever wonder who the us was? You know, sure, we all, all know it's Jesus, you know, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it means it was plural. But also there was another time. In Genesis 11 and 7 it said, Come let us. You know where that was? That was at the Tower of Babel. It says, Come let us and there go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. You see, it said, let us again. So there was three times. And there was one more time in the New Testament, but it was phrased a little bit different. And even in the New Testament, and y'all have heard this time and time again, in John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if you skip all the way down in verse 14, it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. 
the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But see, the Word became flesh, so that was telling us He came to the earth. So see, who, who will go for us? So God was talking to someone, and He was asking a question, who's going to do this? So there was, there was something specific to be done that God wanted done. So as as it, <clears throat> so you can you can picture Isaiah as he's there and he heard God's voice like a thunder. You know who's going to do this work? Who's going to who's going to do these things I want done? You know I can just picture what went on in Isaiah's mind. You know, in, in my own little way of of seeing a vision of such as this, of such magnitude and power how it could have changed and impacted his life such a such a massive way and such a powerful way. And I thought about another verse. You know, when this question was asked, says, who will go for us? I thought about this verse in Romans 10 and 14. It says, how then shall they call on him in whom they do not believe? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? See, how will they preach unless they are sent? And it says, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So see, God wanted to use Isaiah in a particular way. And, And you know what happened on in the book. You know the prophecies and different things. And you can see even in, in those things of how his life was such a massively, drastically changed because of what God did through this vision. And then Isaiah turned around and said this. He said, Then I said, Then I said, Here am I, send me. Whenever he said, Then I said, that means he's answering. Okay, he's turning around and answering God. He, he's given an answer. He, he's, he's, he's probably fixing to pour out his heart. You know, because he's, he's done seeing the Father. So he's going to pour out his heart. And that's another thing, friends. When you see God for who he truly is in here, you're going to pour it. You're going to dump it. You're going to empty it. And it'll change you. It will truly 100% change you. So Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Do you know, many people in this world, we all, and I'm just as guilty as anybody, use the phrase, here I am. Even in many songs, you hear the phrase, here I am. You very, very rarely, which I don't reckon I've ever heard anybody use the phrase, here am I. Do you know, and, and I, I, I truly got to really studying and thinking on this particular phrase. Why did Isaiah say, here am I? Why didn't he say, here I am, God? You know, whenever Samuel was called by God, <clears throat> you know, he, he was woken in his, in, in his in night. He went to Eli, and Eli told him to go back to bed. And time he said, you know, just tell God, you know, here I am. He said, okay, here, here I am. That's, that's what Eli said. I mean, uh, Samuel, I'm sorry. And, you know, and, and there's others, you know, that said, here I am. And, and I really got to wondering, you know, why did this man use this phrase? Here am I. And I got to studying, and I got to looking, and I ran across one thing. And, I, and I'm going to read it to you in a minute. This is really, really profound, and I, and I loved it. And it actually got me to, just about got me to crying when I read it. Because of, I could only think of Isaiah when he, he, when he said, here, here am I. You know, he done seen all of this. Now, and I know I'm repeating myself. He done seen all of these things. And, and most likely he was probably on his knees. He, even if he woke up in the middle of the night, and, and some of y'all might, might have had this happen before, wake up in the middle of the night and you know God is speaking to you and, and you get out of the bed and possibly go in your, in your living room or either right beside your bed, get down on your knees on the floor in the middle of the night because God's done woke you up for something. You don't know why. But you just go, dang, you should get on your knees and go to praying. If you ain't never had it happen, ask God to do it to you. He'll do it. 
wake you in the middle of the night and put you on your knees. But you, you, you could imagine Isaiah, and there's no doubt in my mind, he was on his knees. And he said, here am I. Here am I, send me. This is what this gentleman wrote. The phrase, and, I, and I'll get to it in just one second. The, the phrase, here am I, means forsake. It means to give up. It also means to grow. It also means to leave or even let depart. It also means to stretch forth. Picture those things, those little phrases I just mentioned in a spiritual sense. To forsake, to give up. To stretch forth. The writer wrote this about these two phrases. The phrase, here I am. And, and I, I, y'all listen. I want you to really listen to this. The phrase, here I am. says, God, do you see where I am at? And this, is, this is basically what the phrase would mean. Someone saying, God, do you see where I am at? Come and meet me here. Bring your plan and your will to me and make it fit my mold of where I am in life. This distance between us will only be filled by you coming to me. It places emphasis, and this is it, it places emphasis on where you are in contrast with where God is. This is what a writer wrote about what the phrase, here I am, means. I'm going to read it one more time. God, do you see where I am at? You see what he's saying? Where I am at. God, do you see where I am at? Come and meet me here. Bring your plan and your will to me and make it fit my mold of where I am in life. This distance between us will only be filled by you coming to me. Here's the, the phrase, here I am. God, I see that you want me to, to use me, so I give you total permission to do whatever you see best. I am dropping my plans and fears to come where you want me to be. I will cross the distance between us by coming to you. Use me completely. And he says this phrase, this, this places emphasis on God and declares that you are submitting to God completely. Two different phrases. And it just, it, it touched my heart to the depth. They, they may not be honestly any great difference between the two phrases, here I am or here I, here, here I am or here am I. But when I read that, how many of us in life, and listen to me, how many of us in life want God but we want Him our way? How many of us want God on our knees? How many of us want God only once a week? How many of us want God but just don't want Him to do anything with us? We just want Him our way. We want Him our way. Where is our emphasis in life? Is it on us or is it on Him? Picture Isaiah that day saying, Here am I. I've seen the King of Kings. I've seen the Lord of Lords. I know Him. I know who you are now. Here am I. Here am I. Look at this. God does not call those who are equipped. He equips whom He has called. Isaiah, that day, was changed. Finished the book of Isaiah. He equipped him. He fixed him and He changed him. He wasn't that way in the beginning. 
He wasn't that way in the beginning. Finish the rest of the book and see what Isaiah, how God used him. A British evangelist back in the early 1900s by the name of Leonard, I think it's Ravenhill, wrote this. The greatest miracle God can do today is take an unholy man out of an unholy world. Make that man holy. Then put him back into that unholy world and keep him holy in it. Isaiah said he lived in a land of people of unclean lips. He lived in the same world we live in, guys. They just didn't have cars and airplanes and the technology and all the things that we have today. They were evil. They were nasty. They were vicious. And the whole th anything you can mention today of the people in the world today, they were the same thing then. Same thing. And he lived in it. We live in the same world, but we say it serve the same God. The same God that wanted to use Isaiah and did wants to use us today. If you go and finish the chapter that we're in, God told him, he said, I want you to go and I want you to preach. He said, this is what I want you to tell them. And he said, he, he told them what to tell them. And guess what? He turned right around and said, they ain't going to listen. Basically, he said, they ain't going to listen. But you keep preaching. You keep doing it. And you keep going. What about Ezekiel? Remember Ezekiel when I've when I done a little sermon about the, about, about the dry bones? He told Ezekiel, he said, you go prophesy to them bones. You preach to them bones. Bones, people. Dead bones. F you know, fleshless bones. Dead skeletons laying on the ground. And he told them to go preach to them. Guess what? They didn't listen either. And how many preachers today are standing in front of Pope and stand, standing right where I'm standing today and preaching to dead bones? Because they will not listen. They won't listen to what God says do. But yet they go out and they scream how much they love Jesus. But Jesus says, if you love me, you'll do what I say. If you love me, you'll follow me. You'll follow me. What did the Bible say? He says, take up your cross. And everybody says, oh, we've got to take up our cross and follow Jesus. But that finish the verse daily. He said, do it every day. Isaiah come to this realization. Isaiah come to this realization. His light was turned on in his mind and his heart. And he said, here am I. Here am I. Send me. I'm not telling you to go out and to go to, to the mission field or anything like that. But I will say this. If we call ourselves Christians, guys, if we call ourselves true, born-again Christians, we're called. We are called, period. You don't believe me? Go and read the last few verses of Matthew. He said, "Go into all the world, making disciples." That's our job. That's our job. But this is the big question. This is how I'm going to end it. Are we willing? Are we willing to say? Here am I. Here am I. And you know, we don't, we don't necessarily have to say send me. We don't. But we can say, here am I. Use me. Equip me. Show me. Teach me. Do with me what you want. Let me be your servant. Let me be who you want me to be. Under your conditions, not mine. Are we willing to do that? 
Are we willing to do that? Here am I. Send me. Picture again. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and His train of His robe filled the temple. Does anybody ever want to even see such a thing? Do we have that hunger and desire that we even want to even see that? And even not only that, but above it stood seraphim. One had six, each one had six wings, two covered his face, covered his feet, and two he flew. This is a heavenly thing. This is a spiritual thing. Does anybody even have a hunger or desire to even see such a thing? How many people would say, no, I'm scared. I don't want to see that. There's a good possibility you may not. I want to see me one of them. I do. I really do. Not just because it's in heaven. I just want to see one. Literally. But not only that, and not only, they were flying, and one of them cried one to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And that's all they do is fly and say this. But yet our picture of heaven is going to go, is wanting to go and see ain't so and so. Or this person or that person or go fishing or golfing or lay up in the bed asleep or, or just, you know, whatever. That's their heaven. Do you want to see the heavenly father that this thing is crying out to? over and over and over of a holy God. It says, And the, door, and the post of the door was shaken by the voice. See that? By the voice. They were just crying out so loud. By the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. Do we not all do that today? Do we not live in the same environment as Isaiah did? It says, For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, and one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Remember last week, iniquity and sin, basically the same but different. So see, it, it, it carries it so greatly. The depth of the Scripture can carry it so deep into it to where it should change our hearts and our minds. So Isaiah was changed. He said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom should I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Are we willing? So many people are willing, but they don't want to. And that's the sad part. So many people are willing, but they don't want to. They don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't want to do it God's way. And this is how I'm on clothes. I can only picture in my mind that day that this happened to Isaiah. I can only picture. And every time I read it over and over and studied, the more deeper it got into me, into my heart. And I pray that it does the same thing to you. But you know, are we willing? Do we even want it? The same thing that Isaiah had. Do we even desire it? Do we even hunger for it? Or is it just another story? Is it God's word? Yes. And it's real. It's true. And it lives. He lives today. He lived yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God does not call those who are equipped. He equips those whom he has called. And it works.